Ben Kara from Governor State University um, near Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we're here today to talk a little bit about our programs and um, the admissions requirements for SWIFT programs and to answer questions from some students we have here in the office. So it's still going. <laughs> so I have with me here KP, who is our India country rep. You may not be able to see him, but you may hear him off to the side here um, talking a little bit about the program. So thank you for coming today. So Governor State University is a public university, so a state school. We're funded partially by the government. And as I said, we're located near Chicago, Illinois. Um, we're not in Chicago, we're in the suburbs. So we're about 64 kilometers south of Chicago downtown. Okay? So we're almost in the countryside. We have a lot of land around us. 750 acres worth of land that our campus sits on. So it's very peaceful, very quiet. Um, we don't have strangers coming to campus, you know, because since we're kind of out of the way, um, only the people coming to campus um, they're there only because they have things to do on campus, right? So that makes the campus very safe. Um, we were voted by one website as the safest campus in the state of Illinois. And another website recently voted us the eighth safe, safest campus in the whole U.S. So you know that you're very comfortable and safe there, uh, even though we're close to Chicago. Because I know sometimes you hear bad things about Chicago, but it's actually quite safe. We don't have anything to worry about there. Um, we have four colleges within the university, the College of Arts and Sciences, the College of Business, the College of Education, and the College of Health and Human Services. Um, some of our most popular programs with international students and Indian students in particular are computer science, uh, analytical chemistry, health administration, business, and management information systems. Um, and actually, our management information systems program is changing. And hopefully, by fall 2019, it will be business analytics, which will be like data analytics, so big data. Um, so a very you know hot field, a lot of interest in that right now. Uh, so those are some of our most popular programs. Um, our cost is kept quite affordable. Uh, because we are partially funded by the government. Um, so we try to keep our tuition low. Um, for those of you that are here, here's a list of our programs. And then <laughs> um, the, the cost is based off of classes or credit hours that you take. So it's not off of the degree itself, it's off the courses. Um, so the, um, whether you finish the program within two years or if you are able to finish the program faster, you still end up paying the same amount for tuition and fees, okay? It's just that your living expenses would be less if you finish faster, okay? Um, so the costs are on the other side of your flyer there, if you turn it over. Do you get any scholarships like that? Uh, so scholarships, we have some scholarships, but they're not specifically for international students. So that means every year the scholarships are posted on the website. Um, the scholarships are you know, from donor money, so they can change from year to year. And if you go on the website and you look at the scholarships, you need to look for the ones that say, um, that do not specify US citizenship or do not ask for something called a FAFSA. If it does not say U.S. citizenship or FAFSA required, then you would be eligible to apply for the scholarship. Um, but our costs are quite low because what happens is we often have students who get admission from another university as well, and they maybe get a $10,000 scholarship from another school. But even after they subtract the cost of the scholarship, their tuition money that they're spending out of their pocket 
is still more expensive than what it would cost to go to our institution even without a scholarship. So we just had a student this past fall intake, fall 2018, who had exactly that situation. He had a $10,000 scholarship from another school. He got there, realized how much he was still gonna be paying and realized it would be cheaper to come to us, yeah. so he, he changed. Yeah. So it does happen, you know. Um, we do try to keep it very accessible. Um, also, if you, um, you know, want, if you have time, you can try to find an on-campus job. Um, as an international student, you can work up to 20 hours uh, a semester, or a week on campus as an international student, so that might help you make a little money um, to cover some of your living expenses. And after you have studied for one year, so if you start in spring, um, you'd have to study spring and then fall, and then the following spring, you would be eligible for an off-campus internship if you wanted, you know, if you found an internship. Um, so there is the possibility to do that as well. Um, and as I said, if you take the program, if you maybe take summer classes or if you take four courses in a semester instead of three, then you might be able to um, finish up the program a little faster to kind of reduce those cost of living expenses, um, which could really start to add up after a while. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the cost so that you can understand that. Um, so in order to issue the I-20, once you're admitted, that's the amount that's listed on the flyer that so you're looking what at. What are the requirements of I-20? Okay, yeah. So for, um, depends, for the university admission, for IELTS, it's 6.0, okay? Um, the other requirements depends on the program of study. So, for example, Master's of Computer Science program, no GRE is required. Um, we would just need to see your marks uh, from your undergraduate degree, um, and we would need to see the IELTS or TOEFL or PTE score, um, and then that is what we need in the application for, uh, and that's all we need to make the admission decision. However, a program like MIS, or Business Analytics, in the College of Business, they have additional requirements. So for a program like that, uh, besides the marks and the English proficiency, you would need to take a GRE or a GMAT. Um, and then you would also need three letters of recommendation, and you would need a statement of interest, saying why you want to take that program, and what you plan to do with the degree. Um, so, you know, it can vary. And then the health programs have some of their own requirements as well. So it really depends on the program. Um, even with the business programs, with the GRE and the GMAT requirement, um, if you had very high grades in your undergraduate degree um, at the end of your undergraduate program, or if you have another master's degree already, then you might be able to waive the GRE or GMAT um, but we don't waive it based off of work experience. So it has to be one of the other two reasons. Um, so it can vary. Um, and then let me talk a little bit about the cost here too, because that is very important information as an international student. You need to know how much you're spending. So we have the, um, the total amount, the amount that's no, listed that on your flyer, yeah. That is the amount we have to see in order to issue the I-20. Oh, that's what I, I have this. So, so that's the amount we have to see in order to issue the I-20. But to help explain what that amount is, I have this chart here. So for computer science, for example, since that's a popular program, that's uh, the master's general, or all of the programs listed on here. The tuition is a less than 13,000 USD per year. And the fees are under 3,000 USD per year. Per year. Yeah. This is the year. So you can see the total school costs are, yeah, total, it's like maybe 15, 16 USD for the school fees for one year or 18 credits. 18 credits would be um, six courses. Yes, six courses. <laughs> had to do math in my head for a second. <laughs> um, so then we have about 10,000 USD that we estimate for living expenses, books, 
um, you know, meals, anything like that. So that's how we get the 25,000 USD amount, which is what we need for the I-20. Um, so you can see the actual tuition and fees is, is pretty low because we have living expenses in there. Um, for business programs, um, there anything in the college business is just slightly higher, um, and it's just because they, of the type of accreditation they have. Um, they have something called AACSB accreditation, which is the top accreditation really that a business school can have. And I think there's maybe only 500 business schools in the world that have that type of accreditation. So it means it's a very good program. It also means that their admissions are a little bit more selective. Um, so for the admissions process, when it comes to something like the Masters of Computer Science program, my office makes that admissions decision, which means we can do it very quickly for you. Um, if it's something in the College of Business or the Health um, College of Health, um, those those applications go through the department for the admission decision. The faculty want to see it. So it may take a little bit longer, but still hopefully no more than a couple weeks at the most for those. Um, and of course, you know, we're there kind of pushing them to help make sure that they do the application quickly. Um, so that's a little bit about um, the university and the programs and the costs. Um, but I want to be able to ask, or not ask, I want you to be able to ask any questions you have and so I can um, yes. I recently got to know that the West evaluation is made in Lipsol. Yes, so if you apply through the office here, um, because they're one of our partners, they work through one of our partner agencies, you do not have to pay an application fee. And we will do the transcript evaluation ourselves in our office, so you don't have to get a West or ECE evaluation. That is one of the benefits of applying through the office here. And, uh, it was it was less evaluation previously, so it is totally waived now. That is as long mean. as you're yes, as long as you're applying through okay. the agents, yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. How long it's gonna take to get the I twenty if we apply as well? So if you apply, are you thinking computer science yeah. or yeah, so that's a good question. Computer science or information? Do you have any information for college? We have. Um, so it's yeah, it's the information technology major itself is, is that actually the information um, that's a bachelor's degree, it's not a master's okay. degree, so it's an undergraduate degree. Um, so really computer science is at the master's level or management information systems. Mm -hmm. Right. So the computer science one would be a little bit faster because we can make that decision pretty quickly in our office. And then as long as we have your financial information, we can start the I-20 right away. So it really could just be a matter of a couple of days for that. But once again, if it's College of Business, it has to go to them first for the admission decision. And once they make the decision, then we can issue the I-20. It's all done in my office. So my office um, is with you from basically now, the time of inquiry, through the application, the admission, orientation when you arrive on campus, all the immigration services once you're on campus, um, and even after you graduate, if you go on to do OPT, you're still dealing with my office. So you're with us the whole way through. We get to know you very well. Hopefully we're like family, <laughs> you know, by the end. <laughs> so, yes. So. Could you talk to them about the business analysts? Um, I did mention it briefly, yeah, that the, so if you're interested in the business analytics program, um, right now, it's still listed as MS Masters or MS Management Information Systems. So you would actually apply for MIS, and then hopefully fall 2019 is when it will turn fully into Business Analytics. And if you're in the MIS program at that point, you will be able to continue smoothly into Business Analytics. And any coursework that you've already done, of course, will count towards that degree. Um, we already have business analytics coursework. Um, it's one of the concentrations under the MBA, but we're going to have a, a separate degree of its own that's just business analytics. So it's changing a little bit. It's a little bit confusing because the application and the materials still say MIS, but it will be changing into business analytics. Okay. Yeah. So we have an undergrad student who's trying to apply for his undergrad okay. right now. So, a part of assistance, how to start off? I mean, 
parents are usually very much concerned about their stay and how do they going to live there. Mm -hmm. So usually uh, their choice of place is usually Chicago. So mm -hmm. the Governor State University being very nearby to Chicago yeah. is also a plus point for them. Yeah. So could you just go ahead? Yes. Yeah. So um, explain about the undergrad education. In the yeah. Case. Yeah. So a little background about our university. Um, until about four years ago, our university was only a transfer institution. What that meant is that we didn't have any freshmen or sophomores. We only took um, students starting in their third year of university or at the master's or doctorate level. And then four years ago, we became a full four-year institution and we started admitting freshmen. And when we did that, we wanted to be very um, specific in the way that we help new freshman students. Our university has a lot of freshman students who are first generation college students, so their family hasn't gone to college. Um, maybe they haven't traveled outside of the Chicago area. Um, low income as well. So um, students who um, come from families that haven't had the opportunity really to study at higher education levels before. Um, so we have a lot of experience with that. And we wanted to make sure that um, students are really set up well for their undergraduate programs. So we run a cohort model, which means your first year, year and a half of your program, you're with the same group of students and you take all the same um, beginning coursework together. Um, maybe your group together, so maybe you're with students who are interested in science or students who are interested in humanities. Um, not necessarily the exact same major, but the same kind of overall theme, <laughs> you know, science, arts, whatever. Um, so the first year and a half, you're with that same group taking courses, so you get to know them very well. You make friends right away because you're spending all your time together in your classes, and you get to know the professors very well because the courses are all kept small. Even at the graduate level, um, none of our courses are really more than 30 students per teacher. And in fact, our um, student to faculty ratio is 12 students to one faculty member. We don't have any large lecture hall classes with 200 students. In a, you know, we don't do that at our university. We don't even have a space that will hold 200 students. So the classes are kept small. Then um, during your second year of studies as an undergraduate, that is when you will choose or um, declare your major. So officially start taking coursework in your major. The first part of it is general studies, which is what we do in the US to make sure you have a well-rounded background, and then you go into the major coursework. So you really start with a good base in the cohort model, and then you work up into your major courses and get more specific, and that's when you'll start having other students in your classes, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a very nice model. Um, not many universities have this cohort model for the beginning freshman and sophomore classes. Um, so it's something kind of unique. Your device. Um, your mother is attempting to reach you on certain undergraduate programs, so certain bachelor's programs, um, might lead into a graduate program as well. So if you know that you want to do a bachelor's in business, and then after that you want to do an MBA, um, if you complete our bachelor's of business program, it it leads right into the MBA program, and you can get the MBA in one year instead of two if you've done the bachelor's at our school. Um, if you're interested in some of the health courses, um, there's a pathway program where if you do um, a health undergraduate degree, then you're guaranteed a spot in the graduate program. So there can be some benefits, too, if you think that eventually you want to go on to do a graduate degree. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you weren't here earlier when I mentioned about the safety. I, I think it's very important, especially for the parents, <laughs> to know that um, the campus was recently ranked number one safest campus in Illinois, of the whole state, and eighth safest campus in the U.S. So it's quite safe, quite peaceful, quiet, a good place to study. Um, and you're really surrounded by a lot of faculty and staff who really care. Students be there or, uh, uh, safety will be there? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Only international students will be there? Oh, no, it's, we have domestic students as well. So, yeah, 
Our total student population is around 5,000 students. About half of that is undergraduate, the other half is graduate. And the international population is primarily graduate right now. We do have some undergraduates though, um, but there's not a lot of undergraduate international students. So you'll really be mixed in with the American students and get to know them well. All the meetings, all the nature of the oh. American students. Oh. It's, you know, it's a really great place to be, I think. We have a, a very diverse group. Um, and safety is really important for the, yes. especially for the Indian safety. Yes, it is very safe. Um, I have never felt unsafe down there at all. You know, it's because we're surrounded by so much land and we're on the edge of the suburbs, we really don't have strangers coming into camp. So if someone's on campus, they're there for a reason. They're either a faculty, staff, or a student for the most part. Um, I can maybe jump in. And yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, Katie wants to uh, do so some I, I think you've done too much of talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I am Krishna Prashant, and I am the India Country Manager for Governor State University. Just to answer your question, I had my own education. I did both my master's in business and my MS in project management. University, which is at Indiana State University and Missouri State University in the U.S. One of the primary reasons I actually even chose to go to the Midwest, which is more of a central part of the U.S., is so I could meet and interact with a lot of domestic students, right? Our purpose of going to the U.S. in itself is to be able to meet with a lot of domestic students, understand their culture, share about their experience, and learn from each other, right? As such, if I were to answer questions in terms of safety, one thing I can tell you for sure out of my experience and my previous role was with the U.S. government as well, right? So I worked for the Education USA office in promoting higher education opportunities in the U.S. and I talked to a lot of prospective students and parents about it. But one thing I can definitely tell students and parents is U.S. universities and colleges are the most safest place in the U.S. I'll tell you why because you have your university patrol um, all the time and if you have if you need any assistance or help there's always an app or some kind of way how you can get in touch with those who are monitoring the campus versus you thinking about walking out there on the road and uh, feeling unsafe right when you're in campus especially there's a lot of eyes watching uh, the campus right and one of the other things about the u.s education system is it's not it, Definitely is not like our system where in India your college or the university is most likely compounded or fenced. Whereas there it is a 750 acre campus of the state university. It's almost practically going to cost them tons and tons of money to be able to just think about even just fencing 750 acres. And not just for money aspect, right? The system is in such a way that none of the campuses are bound, are fenced, right? Because you may even run into a place where some universities where you have a university building and then there are private space, maybe there's an apartment that's owned by an individual and then there's another uh, independent building that's owned by the university. Isn't that right, Claire? Mm -hmm. So why, the, it, long story short, right? So especially I can understand as a parent of a prospect to undergrad student, when you're thinking about sending your son to the US for the first time ever and he should be safe, especially. So which is why I said the university patrolling system and there are other ways how we can remain safe. That would also be one of the ways, one of the things that they will talk about at the international student orientation when you come on campus. How can you keep their numbers if you need any emergency? How can you get in touch with them? Or if you are feeling unsafe while you're walking alone from let's say like a computer lab or a library to uh, back, home, back to your home or maybe even for the students also. These are some of the ways how uh, U.S. universities take some measures to help students, especially international students. And and the, I'm not sure if you heard when Kara said, "Oh yes, I think you were there." I know uh, how she talked about the cohort system. Uh, when I mean cohort, it typically works. Uh, GSU has designed in such a way that the freshmen, which is frequently referred to as the freshers, when the when they join a college here in India, how all 50 or 60 or maybe even 100 of them attend the same class all throughout the three, four years of their studies here, right? 
that they have come up with a similar model where at least a year or a first year or a year and a half, their assignment mm -hmm. is probably in the same class with all the other students who join as a freshman or like the first year student, right? So that way, during that first year, he is comfortable with the culture, with the education system, the way the professors, the way the classes are taught, and in fact, the way uh, things are being spoken or communicated. There's so much to it, right? That first year of cohort system gives the student so much to learn and learn at his own pace too, right? And I know the cohort system is designed in such a way that he has to complete 15 credits per semester. However, if he's not able to keep up with 15 credits, then I think he could work with his advisor and with the, and the respective office to even lower the load to 12 credits, which is the minimum requirement for an international undergraduate student. So there's a lot, lot more facilities if we have to keep talking, we can we could talk about it all day long. One of the things I and Kara are here is to answer questions that you probably would not be able to look it up on the internet. There are a few things that you would definitely need to hear from us, right? I'm happy to talk about my personal experience, exactly. I'm happy to talk about my personal experience and Kara is happy to talk about international services and how GSU can help, right? Uh, because we are located pretty close to Chicago, it also, and, and we are about 64 kilometers from Chicago, which is about less than an hour, right? Which gives you the advantage of being able to commute to a nearby city, which is the third largest city in the country, and, and make use of your opportunities while you're looking for a full-time job or an internship or whatever it is, right? And at the same, at the same that's the cost of living only will come. Exactly, Even, yeah. uh, th that's exactly what I'm getting to, right? So uh, GSU is located 64 miles, which is which is about which is a suburb, right? So what that means, yeah, you're not really actually ending up spending a lot more uh, if you were living in Chicago compared to living in University Park. So there's a lot of difference, right? So as a student, you want to try and live conservatively. Right, because you want to try and cut back on some of the expenses so we could finish up our college at a uh, very minimal or a minimal cost, right? But, but when you're looking at earning, you want to really make a lot of money, right? Which is why people want to go to big cities, try and uh, find an employment. So GSU gives that advantage because you could stay uh, 64 kilometers away, pretty close to the campus, get your schooling or college done, and then you're not traveling like hours together to go to for a, uh, a job, especially if you're attending interviews and all of that, it's like less than an hour. And I want to um, stress as well, because um, you weren't here when I said it, uh, my office, the Office of International Services, we're with the international students throughout the full life cycle of their time with the university. So from now at the inquiry stage, through the application stage, through orientation when they arrive on campus, until, uh, you know, through the immigration aspect, you know, why they're students, um, so the, um, you know, any immigration I-20 questions, cultural programming, all that, um, right up until they graduate, and they do OPT work authorization after they graduate, so even as an alumni, it's still my office working with them. Um, at a lot of American universities, you'll see that the admissions, there'll be admissions in one office, um, international student services in another office, alumni fairs in yet another office, but at Governor State University, my office deals with the whole life cycle of that international student, so you really get to know us well, we get to know you well, um, you know, we really know each other, like on a first name basis, you know, <laughs> so we see you all the time, um, so I think that is something that's very nice too for students who are maybe a little worried about um, studying in a foreign country or parents who are worried about letting their students go study abroad, you know that will be there witnessing everything. And so if there's ever a question or a concern, you know, we're just an email or a phone call away. One so. of the things I would always tell the students that I met in the past and would continue telling them is international office or the international services office or each at each university it's called different international student services and Office of International Services and so on and so forth, right? International Services Office is like your second parent or your second aunt, really, right? Because the minute he's on a plane and he's not really 
uh, you're not right next to it, right? From the moment you actually land, or even let's say even before you enter the country, you're the immigration, you know, the question is you stop for whatever reasons, right? Or you do not understand something, or you missed something, then who do you call? Yeah, you could certainly call the parents, but there's only so much that they could help, right? Which is actually the international services office that's going to be from the time you enter the country all throughout until you are in you know, Tetuan, starting to end the kind of thing, right? So that's a long-standing relationship. And it is it, it, it is not just like one of those relationships where we come, we do this presentation, we do these fancy talks, and we sound like, uh, yeah, uh, we, you come on board and we got you covered. No, it is not like that. I've gone through that myself, and I, I know the value of how much international services would have to be in touch with each and every student, right? Because tomorrow, if you're if you're not able to reach uh, your stu uh, your son or your daughter, right? You're gonna the first person you're gonna call is Kara's office, right? So which means they have the responsibility, right? So these are some of the things that you may not be able to go look it up online. You have to figure things out, which is why we're here to talk and give you those first chance experiences. And this is not just at the undergraduate level; this is the graduate level. Even at the students at the PhD level. It is important that they process their paperwork on time, be it the classwork or the what is called as the optional practical training. Let's say after you graduate, you need to find jobs. You need to you need to stay either on a full time student visa or get into a work visa, right? Who takes care of all of this? So there is a designated school official. There is international services office. These people would probably be um, your everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there any questions Wait, that can answer? Yeah, this is a low time. Uh huh. Five, five, six times. Okay. So, in that phase, we all have this pre graduation process. Like the ESL, English graduation Yes, we do have. I think. Uh, so, you were looking at applying for your master's or your undergrad? Okay. So let's say if someone does not have, okay, so as an English uh, proficiency test, you have to take either the IELTS or the TOEFL or PTE, which is a Pearson test for English, right? As an international student, you have to take one of these. And if you do not, and in the school, the GSU requires is on a, in IELTS, you're expected a 6.4, which is otherwise called a 6, right? In TOEFL, you have to have 80 with a such, and such. for graduate. Oh, that's for graduate, graduate. and graduate. Yeah. So undergraduate and graduate are different from okay. TOEFL and PTE. Okay. So in PTE for the graduate, uh, for the master's programs, it's 53, but the section cut off 53. I think in a little bit, Kara is going to try and see if we can pull the scores for undergraduate. So what happens? Now the question is, what happens if, we, if I do not have a 6.0 or if I don't meet that 80 uh, section cut off or the overall cut off, right? There are two ways. Of course, number one, you either retake it to try and see if you can improvise it, which is, in my opinion, the easier thing that you can do. Or if you're trying to say, okay, I'm going to try and take some English speaking classes before I can start my actual program, whatever program it is, then realistically, you could do that, right? But it is going to take you like a semester to do that versus you trying to work really, really hard just for a month and or a month or two to get taken care of your IELTS or, or any of your English test, right? Because you're going to be thinking about coming to the US, spending a semester, which is going to cover for you, which, is, which means you're going to have to pay for your living expenses plus your semester uh, fees to just learn English, right? What does that mean? You're going to increase your cost of education there in Thailand, right? So I think we're not discouraging, but I'm just letting you know from a student's perspective, especially from an Indian student's perspective, I can certainly understand. We want to try and keep the cost of our education as low as possible. And if you're thinking about, oh, my ultimate destination is to just step on the US soil, I don't care what I'm going to start off with, then you could do that. But if you want to try and be as economical as possible, I would try to do take English classes here or do whatever it takes to meet the English proficiency, right? The, one of the other things what's going to happen is when you don't have a good English score, what's going to happen is they are not 
The university may not be able to issue an I-20, which is the official certificate that you get admitted into the U.S. University for so and so program, even though you may want to, to uh, study computer science or whatever the program is, right? The admission I-20 is not going to say that you're going to get into computer science. It's only going to talk about that you are there to study in the university, right? Imagine you standing in front of the visa officer trying to say, hey, I'm here to go to GSU, so I can study English. I'm not saying the visa chances are impossible, but I am saying the consular officer knows that most of the schools and colleges in India, medium of instruction is English, right? And if you haven't been able to fare well in a country where you were born and raised and studied for 15 years, 18 years, 20 years, and then you're thinking about going to another country do just a semester and then get onto a program. I'm not saying once again, it's not doable. It is still doable, but look at your chances, right? You're going to be spending here trying to get your, pull your TOEFL score up in India quickly versus going there, spending US dollars trying to do that for an entire semester. So the TOEFL requirements for an undergraduate student is 68, so 68 overall. Um, with subsection scores of 19 in reading, 16 in writing, 18 in listening, and 15 in speaking. Uh, for Do you know if you've already taken your TOEFL or IELTS, or you have to take it? Yes, I have. You've already taken it? Yes. Okay, so which means, okay, if you're thinking about taking IELTS, then... IELTS is just 6.0, no matter if you're going for undergraduate or graduate level score scores. No, I think 6.0. Anybody looking at uh, PTE or yes. PTE? So uh, master's level PTE is 53 over, overall, okay. with 53 in each subsection. So reading, writing, listening, speaking, 53 for everything. Mm -hmm. Every section should have 53 or higher, yes. right? Yeah. So, so if you have a 50 in one section and then 60 in another section, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to be we may have to look at, the department may have to look at the profile and then come back and tell you if they want you to retake it or not. It depends. If I were you, I would retake the PT and make sure all the sections are at least for PT or higher. Uh, GRE is not required for every program, so GRE it depends on what you're going to study. You guys are thinking about computer science or what programs do you guys have? Your science or two? Yeah. Which means okay. MBA? MBA. MBA. So two business, three computer science, right? So computer science, the good good news is computer science program doesn't ask for GRE. But MBA does. MBA does. <laughs> right? Yeah. MBA does. Yeah. Yes. But so MBA for anything in the College of Business, you would have to take either a GRE or a GMAT. Um, there is no minimum score necessarily. Um, because they look at the whole application package. So they look at your your marks and your undergraduate education. They look at your GRE or your GMAT. They look at your English proficiency skills. They look at your recommendation letters and your statement of purpose. They look at it as a whole package. Um, of course, the higher the score, the better, right? <laughs> um, but if your scores are a little bit low, but you have really good grades from your undergraduate coursework, then it might balance out. So I think that's really nice that there's not a, a hard minimum for that. They try to take the whole application into um, into review, you know, look at it as a whole picture. So, do you know what you're interested in studying? Business. The business administration. Business administration, okay. Yeah, so at the undergraduate level, of course, you don't have to take any GREs or GMATs, <laughs> which is good. I also said a 6.0. Yes. We are SAT optional, right. which means you don't really have to have yeah. an SAT or right. an ACT. But I'm sure you probably have realized this by now. In the US, if you are thinking about doing a business administration program or whatever undergrad program it is, it is for four years and not for three years. Right? Some people may not really know that. They got an ACT in 2000. So for you, for application, we would just need to see your marks and yeah, like your mark sheets, your transcripts for all of your high school studies, and then um, we would need to see your IELTS score report. 
Um, you don't need any letters of recommendation. You don't know, need an SAT or ACT. So um, as long as you have um, decent grades from your high school studies and you have uh, at least a 6.0 IELTS, then you should be admissible to the university. But from my experience, those who are applying to your computer science or business programs, do you guys all have a four-year bachelor's degree or does any of you have a three-year bachelor's degree? Four-year bachelor's degree. I have a three-year bachelor's degree. Okay. You have a three-year bachelor's degree from MATAC, you have a three-year bachelor's degree from India, you have a three, you four have four years. Four years. Which means you guys are okay, but those with three years experience, with three years undergrad, GSU, I mean, 60% of times, if you're looking, and you guys are all from JNTU, Osmania, JNTU, 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 right? So, minimum of 60% is what we would ask for, for those with just three years of undergrad, then. You would have to probably, for most universities in the US do not take a three year degree from India you know, for entry into a master's program. Because in the US, we consider a bachelor's degree to be four years of study. Um, so with, when you have a three-year degree, it doesn't mean you can't study in the US, but it might mean you have to come in at the undergraduate level, so transfer your coursework in from India, and then finish out the equivalent of the US bachelor's degree. So maybe do a year, in some cases it might have to be a year and a half, of undergraduate coursework, you earn a U.S. bachelor's degree, and then you can go into the master's program. Um, so you might have to do a little bit more work, but I think you're probably going to find that with a lot of U.S. schools. Um, there are some U.S. universities out there that will take a three-year degree, but most of them do not. So it's, I know not the best news, but you know, if you really want to study in the U.S., you still might be able to find a way to do it. You just have to be willing to do a little bit of undergraduate coursework first. Which is why now you realize why um, our undergrad programs in the US are for four years, because mm -hmm. US is one of those countries which would ask you for 16 years of formal education mm -hmm. before you can start a master's degree. Or, so, or the alternative option is you're gonna, you could try and see if there is like a one year diploma or years, which is obviously a natural choice of the any master's program. So which means you'd need that 16 year education and then come on board to do your if you're still interested in doing your master's in the US. A four year master's degree or something like that? Undergraduate, so if you're applying for a master's program, yes you you said you're from J and yeah. right? Sixty percent is the minimum. Do you know how much you have? You have more than 60%. 15 or 56. Yeah. So they're going to have to try and see. So for that case, we, we just we have to do a credential evaluation. Okay. It doesn't mean that you won't be admissible. It just means we have to review it more. So if you have at least a, a 60% from some place like JNTU or Osmania, then, and you have the, you know, the appropriate English proficiency scores, then for computer science, we can admit you without having to do a full evaluation of your studies. But if you have under 60%, then we'll have to see your full coursework, and we'll have to look at it course by course and evaluate it on our end to see if you meet the admission requirement. Uh, I do have IELTS for 6.0, and in all modules, uh, like income module, I'm lagging. So the good news, yes, that's why so I said, uh, mm -hmm. with respect to IELTS, they're not looking at, you're not looking yes. at the subsection yeah. scores. So that's not. Yeah, so IELTS, we just look at the overall 6.0. Like if you're going for a four-year course, mm -hmm. the four-year course, what do you call it? Well, if, if at all, you're going for a four-year four course, mm -hmm. so which have done with a graduate in here in India, mm -hmm. and they're going with a four-year course, mm -hmm. what well, you would be actually, you would be tr trying to transfer in your coursework in India to count towards a U.S. degree. So you would actually be studying towards a bachelor's degree in the U.S. And we would look at your coursework that you already did here in India 
to try to give you credit for that. So then you would only have to take enough courses to meet our four year requirement. So in the end, you would end up with a US bachelor's degree as well. So you'd have an Indian bachelor's degree, you'd have a US bachelor's degree, and then you'd go on to do a master's degree in whatever field you're interested in. So you'd end up with more degrees. <laughs> But you're not retaking the full four years. You know, you're just taking what you're missing to equal a U.S. degree. And that can be to like GRE or to like as a bachelor's you need to go to the IELTS. Bachelor's degree you don't do GRE. Yeah, it's just IELTS. So as a counselor, you can answer that we are going for a bachelor's degree. Right. Exactly. Because you would be, you'd be doing a bachelor's at that point. You might find you would say bachelor's, mm -hmm. right? Just that you will have to present and make the points to the professor to understand why you would you go again for your bachelor's degree when you already have a bachelor's degree, right? So which means you're gonna have to try and make another because I am what my next plan is to pursue is my master's degree, mm -hmm. which I would need 16 years of formal education. And the university looked at my uh, courses and they were willing to offer me to get into this pathway as a bachelor's program where I finished one year of uh, my bachelor's, so I did a bachelor's degree before I can get into my master's degree, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Again, it comes to the same question in which because we're going with the higher mm -hmm. the 6.0 minimum. So it doesn't matter if you have to have the 6.0 minimum. about it. Right now, we <laughs> Especially talking from your stand, right? You already have the, the one, already one has the high mark, and then you want to do it, be another semester for you to make it just English. So before you can even get to your masters, you have to already one and a half. Years. Yeah, I'm starting with my BTEC in and it's already almost like one and a half. No, it's not an issue as long as you meet the qualifications. Um, the admission requirements, that's all that matters. Um, it's okay if you've taken a break or if you've been working in the meantime. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah. In some cases, it might be beneficial. You know, so, um, so, no, it's okay. No problem with that. What all you said. Any other questions that we can answer? Like, for example, if we are being rejected, for example, for a course. Again, we need to, we can like generate some more items or else we need to wait for other intake for, for your university. So if you apply uh, and you don't meet the requirements because of the IELTS or something like that, um, we would deny you admission, but you could try to retake the IELTS and send it to us, we, you know, and we could see if we can still admit you. Uh, for the same semester. So if you're not necessarily having to fill out the whole application again, mm. you're just submitting updated scores to us. Okay. Yeah, so, and um, if you do get admitted and you're not able to come right away, you can defer your admission for up to one year. So if you get admitted for the spring, you know, January intake, and something happens, maybe you don't have enough time to go through the visa process here, um, you know, sometimes students are rejected for the visa the first time. If you want to defer to summer or fall to give you more time for that process, that's okay too. That happens a lot as well. Can we reschedule the admissions? Yeah, that's what that's called. That's the deferment. Yeah. So up to one year without reapplying, you're able to push back the actual start of your program once you've been admitted. Like for instance, if you're going with uh, rejection. So 15 days, can we get generate one more item to offer 20 days or within one year? So you're talking so you about the visa rejection or you're yeah. talking about the rejection? I'm talking about rejection, plural. And yeah. after that, yeah. we need to generate. You mean rejection, you're talking about the visa rejection, too. Yeah. yeah. So, so you don't need a new I-20 for it unless you are pushing your attendance back to another semester. So if you are rejected for the visa and there's no more time to apply for the January intake, then we would have to issue you a new I-20 for the summer or the fall intake. But you can reapply for the visa with the same I-20 for the same semester. Okay. 
So sometimes we have students apply for a visa two or three times off the same I-20, aiming for the same semester. That's okay. okay. The only thing about that that you really need to consider is if you've been rejected for the visa once, you should maybe stop and think about what happened at the visa appointment. Make sure you have all your answers. You know, make sure you really know why you want to study um, in the U.S., why you want to study at Governor State, why you want to study whatever program you're interested in. Because if you just keep going back to the consulate right away without changing anything, then you're going to expect the same outcome, right? If you do the same thing, the outcome is going to be the same. So if you get rejected for the visa, don't give up because a lot of students do better the second time. They're less nervous because they know what to expect. And that's normal. But don't go back until you have you know, thought it through and you feel more comfortable with the answers, like how to respond. So you know, that's always something to keep in mind because sometimes students get rejected for the visa and right away they scheduled a new appointment and they're trying to go back the next week and it's like, wait, stop. <laughs> you need to think first. You know, you need to be better prepared this time. So that's really, you know, something to keep in mind is the preparation for it. Like, uh, we are going to the three primary graduation days. Mm -hmm. So we need to write a, we need to like uh, go to the interview meeting. Or else we, uh, we can go directly with the I-20. If you, so the I-20 is for the visa interview. The WES evaluation is a transcript evaluation. So that's where we look at your studies that you've already done. That's not required if you apply through the you, office here. You wouldn't get your I-20 without the meet the requirements for transfer. Yeah, so the and WES is part of the admission. The I-20 is part of the visa process. So, But if you apply through this office uh, for admission, then you don't have to do a WES because we will do the transcript evaluation ourselves. We will look at your studies, at your mark sheets, and evaluate it ourselves. That is one of the benefits of applying through this office. You don't have to pay the application fee and you don't have to do the evaluation. We'll, we'll do it. And so KP is based in Chennai. He's here in India all the time. Um, so if you ever have any questions about Governor State, um, about the visa process or, you know, just coming to the U.S. in general, you're more than welcome to reach out to him. That's his job, <laughs> is to help answer any questions you have on behalf of the university. Um, of course, you are welcome to contact my office as well, but, you know, there's a big time difference, so it might be faster <laughs> to contact him, you know, since he's here locally. I ran out of my business cards, which is why I have to write my name, my email, my email again, my phone number. But yeah, if you guys have interest, you can write me. I'm so open. Feel free to call, WhatsApp, email. I'm happy to answer questions about GSU, about Germany, about applying to US trade schools and colleges. Feel free to do that. Yeah. You want to make sure you guys have a pleasant experience. <laughs> yes, and we would love to see you all at Governor State in the future for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Well, no more questions? All right. Well, thank you so much for thank coming. You. Yeah. Good you luck. Go. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. You done? Yes. <laughs> um. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you.